Welcome to EDI on BIV, and I'd like to begin our show by acknowledging that we're broadcasting from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Today, our discussion will focus on indigenomics, what that is, and how it can be used to create greater equity, diversity, and inclusion in the broader economy. My co-host is Chastity Davis Alphonse, a multi-award-winning Indigenous Relations Strategic Advisor and the founder of Chastity Davis Consulting. She's also previously one of BIV's 40 Under 40 winners. Chastity, thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me here. Our guest today is Caroline Hilton, an international Indigenous business leader, speaker, advisor, and facilitator. She's the founder and CEO of the Indigenomics Institute and the author of the newly released book, Indigenomics, Taking a Seat at the Economic Table, which is now available. Caroline, great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Why don't we start our conversation by discussing what indigenomics is and why it's a term and a concept business leaders should really be familiarizing themselves with. Absolutely, thank you. Um, indigenomics is modern indigenous economic design. It is essentially about uh, revaluing indigenous knowledge systems around economy those knowledge systems that have existed for thousands and thousands of years and have allowed our people to be resilient and to be able to create economies today and to be able to establish our indigenous economic strength both today and in our future. And is it clear where you start with that? Is there a roadmap? Is it more complex than that? Um, I like to start with resilience. Um, recognizing our strength as people, that to be able to determine and establish that we are powerful people, we are economic powerhouses today. What is important in that concept to me is that as a country and as a regions, we need to be able to build from a new truth. And that truth is to recognize that the development of Canada was established on systemic Indigenous economic exclusion. And that to be able to recognize that today and build a new story from that, Indigenous peoples have already begun to build the foundation of a new story of our economic resilience and building Indigenous economic strength today. Thank you, Caroline. Um, we talk about uh, the economy being, or that Indigenous people have been excluded from the economy systemically. So what does economic reconciliation look like um, in your framework of Indigenomics? For sure. So I refer to that Indigenous peoples are taking our seat at the economic table. So that concept that Indigenous peoples have been systematically disinvited to the economic table of this country over time is an important realization. And that story is not so much highlighted within our education systems, but to realize the expression of that within our federal relationship, within the Indian Act, and within the structures that prevent and keep us within um, both reserve systems, within governing systems, and within our ability to respond to um, creating economies within our traditional territories. Is there also uh, economic reconciliation, Caroline, that needs to take place between uh, sort of the, the business to business perspective? So between Indigenous nations and entrepreneurs and leaders, as well as the broader economy at large? Yeah, absolutely. I refer to Indigenous. Um, there was programs and services. You know, today we're a budget day federally. We're going to see um, expenditures that are focused um, uh, with an Indigenous focus. The concept of Indigenomics is essentially that we need to convene the tools, the resources, the structures, and the leadership to be able to support Indigenous economic design putting money towards programs and services and within a short-term mandate annually or over a, a government's mandate is not Indigenous economic design. The concept of emerging an Indigenous economy requires the structure, it requires uh, the investment, and it requires the tools to be able to establish Indigenous economic strength. My work has really been focusing that 
we need to get over this concept of the socioeconomic gap, that keeping measuring the same thing and keep measuring and telling the same story that we've really not moved very far puts Indigenous peoples both in the perceptions of falling behind, it puts within the limitations of the language of deficit, and it creates the perceptions of Indigenous peoples being a cost on the system. So if we look at today being budget day, we look at this concept of uh, transfer to indigenous nations, we need to start looking at that in terms of investment into indigenous economic design, instead of um, imbalance of the equation of the relationship of socioeconomic um, processes. It's that is where reconciliation will occur is within the balance sheet of this country. I, I love the whole concept of redesigning um, the system and the structure and that you're highlighting um, the deficit language around in Indigenous peoples being a part of, um, of the economy, which I think we, we always have been. So I appreciate you unpacking that for us. Um, what barriers to greater economic participation do Indigenous peoples and entrepreneurs face from your perspective? For sure. I, I always refer that I'm five foot two and that if you add up all the studies that refer to the limitations and barriers of what Indigenous peoples face, it's way taller than I am. And we need to be telling a new story around um, the tools and structures of overcoming those barriers um, and limitations. We had a national uh, news story this week about the readiness to operate the $150 million Indigenous uh, Business Growth Fund where the stimulus of bringing $150 million to Indigenous businesses nationally becomes a significant tool and brings the leadership and structure to increasing opportunities and increasing capital um, to Indigenous businesses and corporations. While the experience of limitation of capital to Indigenous businesses within the larger Indigenous economy has been an ongoing story, what becomes important today is to be able to understand that we've been successful in spite of. We've been successful as businesses in spite of a capital shortage. We've been successful in business in spite of a program and service or piecemeal approach to the Indigenous economy overall. And it's when we see these structures and these opportunities, for example, within the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the expression of a right to an Indigenous economy is being um, defined across this country. Right now we're seeing it within the Mi'kmaq people um, who are describing both within their historical treaty, but also in the modern expression of the right for commerce, the right to exchange fish for money. And while the stipulations and limitations and the racism that reflects within the opposition to Indigenous peoples having a right to an economy, that in itself is really what taking a seat at the economic table is about. We need to move over and make room and make space for Indigenous business within this economy. And I know through our conversations, Carol Ann, and on the Indigenomics Institute's website, there's this concept of growing it to a hundred billion dollar Indigenous economy within a relatively short amount of time. What do you think is needed to get there in addition to what you've spoken about in our conversation now about dismantling some of that systemic racism and, and opposition and oppression that's existed? What else do you think is needed to foster that kind of growth? Yeah, for sure. I think that the ability to move out of the existing constructs of GDP as a measurement of Indigenous economy is essential. If we look at the shortcomings of the TD Economic Report in 2016, which established as an estimate the size of the Indigenous economy at 32 billion, it used the uh, framework of GDP. So looking at um, the core components of how we would measure a larger national economy. But what becomes important in that is the absence of three core components. The asset base of nations is significant. 
um, the revenue streams of nations is significant and indigenous businesses and the investment environment. If we look at those three core components, um, what we begin to see and begin to shape a narrative is essentially that we are significantly closer to a $100 billion Indigenous economy than we think we are. And what becomes important in that concept of $100 billion is this idea of the status quo and underperformance. Without a forward-looking target of $100 billion, allows the conditions of lack of attention to design of the Indigenous economy, lack of focus in terms of investment in the structures and tools of it, and also the shortcomings of data and the shortcomings of metric systems of itself. My work at the Indigenomics Institute is essentially about driving metrics, shaping meaning, and establishing the structure and design of a $100 billion Indigenous economy. But asking that question, what way do we make decisions differently at $100 billion than we do at $32 billion? To be able to look at the opportunity, if in fact we're looking at $68 billion as a difference of $32 and $100, what does $68 billion of Indigenous economic activity look like? And how can we support the investment into that as an opportunity? And what is most important in that concept to me is that we stop seeing Indigenous peoples as a burden on the system and we start seeing Indigenous peoples as economic powerhouses of which we are. That's really inspiring um, to hear that we are closer than we think we are. Can you give us any early examples of any early adopters or anything that's shifting um, in, in the federal government or in the business community since um, you've been uh, sharing the concept of Indigenomics and implementing it in our country? I think one important um, process is the federal government uh, moving forward on the concept of a 5% national Indigenous procurement target. To be able to look at 5% of national procurement to be Indigenous focused in itself essentially expresses as close to a billion dollars annually of Indigenous economic activity going to our businesses nationally, which is significant. To be able to understand that as an annual contribution to this concept of 100 billion, we begin to see and shape pathways towards that possibility. I did a piece of work recently uh, where I identified a $100 billion tour, where I started to look at nations that were doing uh, business and revenue generation within major projects over a billion dollars. We look right here in Vancouver, we see Squamish Nation who essentially has the ability to change the skyline of a world-class city, to realize through real estate development, ownership, equity, capital, and the, the development of a significant project that the skyline of a city as that we know it represents and is shifted and tells a new story of indigenous economic empowerment. And finally, I think another example, we look to the Yukon government who's established a very strong pathway to um, indigenous procurement within the regional or the territorial uh, government. So realizing procurement as a pathway for indigenous inclusion is a significant tool of indigenous business success and leadership. I'm reflecting on a couple of the things you said, Caroline, that really struck me. One is the language that's used and how that tells the wrong narrative and also the metrics that are used and how that doesn't capture the growth that could be or that's happening right now. From a research point of view, is there any low hanging fruit, so to speak, areas that should be being captured by research, areas where we need more data to tell the right kinds of stories? and narratives. I'm thinking about if we have anyone in educational institutions or any businesses that would put out these reports that aren't necessarily telling the full picture, what might be some areas that would be ripe ground to cover? Yeah, for sure. I'm going to be releasing a report through the Institute that's called Shaping Money, Meaning and Metrics in the Emerging $100 Billion Indigenous Economy, essentially using a wellness framework. 
the concept isn't about 100 billion for the sake of indigenous economic growth. It's 100 billion to what is the formation of that as a foundation of wellness for our communities. And I think that's the distinction of an indigenous economy is that it creates the space for the foundation element of the continuation of our people, the continuation of our ways of life and the well-being of our people. So shaping money, meaning and metrics in the 100 billion as an exercise of looking at that in describing a wellness-based economy. The other component I think is we'll be working on a $100 billion national economic study within this uh, 2021 year. And I think that being able to demonstrate indigenous economic strength instead of uh, socioeconomic gap is a seismic um, insertion essentially into Canada's reality to make new decisions, new beliefs, and new actions based on Indigenous economic strength. I'm excited to read that report when it comes out um, and to start uh, shifting the dialogue and the conversations that we're having in regards to Indigenous businesses. Um, what are some meaningful ways for corporations and corporate leaders to support the growth of the Indigenous economy? For sure. And um, I refer to the work I do at the Indigenomics Institute. I describe what's called an Indigenomics economic mix. So it's really about shifting the language and looking at places of opportunity. The concept is essentially 12 levers or enablers of Indigenous economic growth and design. Some of those levers include equity ownership, where we see groups like the First Nations Major Project Coalition who are facilitating the economic space and capacity for nations to participate as equity owners within major projects. That is a significant development within this country where we're seeing examples out of Winnipeg where nations, collections of nations are owning entire significant pieces of infrastructure such as rail lines where we're understanding the role of indigenous peoples as a concept of value creation in a region and in a major project. Other examples within this concept of the indigenomics economic mix include capital, uh, technology, clean energy, procurement, uh, trade, entrepreneurship, but looking at these as places of investment, looking at these as places of the creation of Indigenous economic space and partnership and investment, that in itself is shifting towards seeing Indigenous peoples as a strategic opportunity and the space to develop partnerships with. I'd be remiss, Caroline, if I didn't ask you at least a little bit about your book. Uh, tell us first how it's being received and any feedback you've heard, and second, what you hope readers take away from the book. Yeah, for sure. I'm super excited to um, see the book really generating positive conversations. Um, taking a seat at the economic table is one part um, telling a story of the development of Canada and the exclusion of Indigenous peoples. And the other part is building the metaphor of the table and building that is essentially an invitation into our own leadership. We have a choice in front of us. Our ability to facilitate Indigenous business relationships, it becomes fundamental to understand that the future of our regions and the future of our country is intrinsically now tied to Indigenous economic success. The legal environment has shifted so substantially that the development of Indigenous economic inclusion has happened at such a rapid pace. I look to the work of Bill Gallagher, a uh, lawyer based out of Toronto, who describes Indigenous peoples as res resource rulers within this country. And he describes that it's close to 300 cases where Indigenous peoples have won within the courtrooms of this country realizing that this legal relationship that was not dealt with appropriately early in the development of Canada is now expressing itself and it's creating new economic space for Indigenous peoples today. 
And that's really fundamental to this concept that indigenous peoples are taking our seat at the economic table. And it can be met with racism, it can be met with fear, or it can be met with leadership and insight to further investment, design and inclusion. Thank you so much for that. I, I also want to ask you a quick final question from me anyway, um, about this time we're in now. We have governments at all levels looking to rebuild the economy and figure out what the post pandemic economy looks like. Is there any special opportunities now to really put Indigenomics front and center as a, an important part that's critical to our overall economic growth and rebound? Yeah, absolutely. I am very curious, particularly because it is budget day to day of how much the government gets it. Are we investing in this concept of um, the social cart pulling the economic horse? When will we get the equation right? If we look at 90% of expenditures within the federal um, fiscal relationship to nations, if 90% of that is socially based, um, some reconciliation focused and leaving a minimal amount that is economic based, the government won't get it. Being able to facilitate the pathway for a balanced equation of economic investment in this country tells of a future where a post-COVID economic response is based on Indigenous economic inclusion, of seeing the opportunity that Indigenous economies are generative and constructive and need to be able to be designed and invested into. Great, and my final question, Carol Ann, uh, wish we had more time to continue to learn about um, Indigenomics and how that will look in our country. But my final question for you is, what is your vision beyond like a hundred billion dollars. Like what does that actually look like um, in Canada to have a hundred billion dollar economy um, that indigenous people are driving and thriving and being successful in? So what does that actually look like on the ground? Yeah, for sure, I love that. Um, I think that it's really about that the visible structures of indigenous ownership, indigenous led institutions, um, the ability to understand um, the requirement of a national Indigenous economic institution, where the ability to measure economic strength is the core language used within this country instead of the socioeconomic gap. While I realize that the experience of the socioeconomic gap is real for our people, that that reflects poverty, that reflects uh, social ills, that reflects um, challenges that have been inherent within the development of this country, but to shift away from the use of the language of the socioeconomic gap and start utilizing language of Indigenous economic strength, 100 billion is really only a target to shift our focus away from. It's really a target to shift our attention towards and to be able to direct our attention to a new through a new lens instead of the inherited concept of the Indian problem and start establishing perceptions, language, beliefs, and actions based around Indigenous resilience. That is where we will be able to build from. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Caroline. That's a, a powerful and inspiring vision. And hopefully we have the opportunity to have you back on this podcast, perhaps after you release that upcoming report. So it would be really interesting to see the findings in that and recommendations in that. But for now, thanks for your time. Yeah, we'll be expecting to release the report at my upcoming virtual forum on June 22nd and 23rd. So it'll be good. I think it will be well received. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And thank you, Chastity, for joining me as a co-host on the show. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Our guest today is Caroline Hilton. She is the founder and CEO of the Indigenomics Institute, and her book is now out and available for purchase. It's Indigenomics, Taking a Seat at the Economic Table. My co-host today, Chastity Davis-Alphonse, founder of Chastity Davis Consulting. And this has been EDI on BIV. I'm Haley Wooden. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back with a new episode of our show next Tuesday.